I'm Cinder Sinclair, and you're watching Good Life. Welcome to Good Life. I'm Dean Wilson. I'm so glad you're with us wherever you are. If you're joining us here locally in Santa Barbara, California, at TV Santa Barbara, we welcome you. If you're joining us at goodlifetelevision.org, like so many of you are, uh, we're grateful. You can also find us on all the social media platforms, Good Life TV, uh, and our podcast, which is, is really taken off. It's called Good Life Conversations. So you can Search for Good Life Conversations on all the different podcast platforms. You can find us there. And uh, Good Life is about the good stuff. And we're talking with really great people. We've had stories. If you go to goodlifetelevision.org and you scroll a little bit, you can find so many great stories, so many great people, uh, overcomers, entrepreneurs, public servants, uh, creators, young people, old people. We've, we've had a little bit of everything. So it's been a lot of fun, and we're so glad that you're with us. Uh, today I have a really special lady on the program, a uh, good friend and well-known here in Santa Barbara. Uh, Dr. Cinder Sinclair is with me. Welcome. Thank you, Dean. Here Thanks we are. for the invitation. Yeah, I've been on her program twice, <laughs> uh, which is really fun. I love your program. Um, oh, it's a great opportunity. So Nonprofit Connect with a K is what Cinder's working on now. So let me just tell a quick little bit about you. So Cinder... Uh, graduated University of Phoenix with her Doctor of Management in 2008 as her master's. Um, and most of all, she has raised five children, 13, has 13 grandchildren and nine great-grandchildren. Uh, and and I've, been, I've been digging into this at, at night. This is her new book. It's called My Wild and Precious Life, A Memoir of Joy, Grief, and Adventures. Uh, by Dr. Cinder Sinclair, so I, I highly commend this to you. I've been, I, I was, I, I have to admit, I was bouncing around yesterday in this because I wanted to read different sections. I, <laughs> so I haven't read it all the way through. I've just been bouncing around, but I've been so fascinated by your life. Um, it has been an adventure, hasn't it? <laughs> it's been a big ad one adventure after another. And, and that's so great. You know, I think the sense of adventure that that we can have about life you know and and, and we'll get to this in a, more in a second but when things don't go our way or they go different than we expected mm -hmm. and you and you talk a lot about resilience which i want to get to but, but let's go back before i get into all that i could it's very exciting <laughs> where, where'd you come from where'd you grow up oh gosh that's not an easy okay so hmm, i was born in selma alabama and then third grade we moved to Manhattan Beach, California. And then from third grade through high school, every two years we moved from Manhattan Beach to upstate New York, back forth, back forth. So, but I graduated high school in Manhattan Beach. Okay, so you bounced around. Yeah. Now tell us about y your father. Tell us a little bit about that story. Oh gosh, it's so exciting. You know, I do all this work with um, various nonprofits and one day, the Santa Barbara Genealogy Society invited me to come and facilitate their strategic planning session, you know. I thought, oh, okay, that, that sounds like fun. So I went there and I met someone who was a professional genealogist. Well, I had never known who my father was. I assumed I never would know. Here I'm, you know, well into my 70s and I mean, how many people don't know who their father is? And so uh, she said, well, I bet you I could find him. Well, I agreed to work with her only to be polite because I thought, I have no information. Well, within four months, this is during COVID, using only DNA and a bunch of research that those genealogists use, uh, she found him. I mean, he had passed away because he had cancer and all that, but I had a name and all that. And, and all of a sudden then I had seven new half siblings. Can you imagine? Unbelievable. Yeah. And so you told me, we had lunch, you told me this story about contacting your siblings. Yes. So what was that like? It was a little scary at first because I didn't want them to feel like, you know, I was barging in their life or right. wanting something from them, you know. Um, but I just sort of tiptoed into that. And uh, so now there are seven and I have communicated with four of the seven. One of, all they all live in Florida. One lives in London. And so in about... I don't know, a month or so, I will be there having dinner with her in London. Really? Uh, yeah, it'll be the first one that I've met. 
face to face. The others, um, phone, email, text, all that. Wow. But they're very, well, we want you to know, sister, that we love you. Is that sweet? Really? Yeah. So it's been like a, this, like a reunion. I mean, like a, yeah. not a reunion, a union yeah. coming together after all these years. Yeah. Pretty that's exciting. Inc that's incredible. Uh, so over COVID, you wrote this book. I did. First of all, talk about the process. What was it like? Because this is amazing. And the level <laughs> of detail and the stories and the, talk about writing the book. You know, after I found my father, I thought, wow, it feels so good to kind of know who I am or where I come from right. or that sort of thing, my, my history. And so um, I thought, oh, it'd be nice if my kids knew that too. I bet they'd appreciate it if I kind of, you know, wrote something up. And um, so that was a thought I had. That was the reason for writing the book. But I, you know, I've written lots of articles, but I'd never written a book. Oh my gosh, where do you start? How do you do it? I didn't know. And so one day I was looking in the Montecito Journal and I happened to look at the classified. For, I never look at classified. I saw this little tiny ad, David Wilk will help you write your memoirs. He's an editor or whatever. So I cut it out and I carried it around with me for a little while. Finally, I contacted David. He lives in Ojai. He's an editor. He's great. And so he would just, I would go there every week or so. We'd sit in his backyard. He'd ask me questions about my life. And then he'd say, okay, now go write about your childhood. Okay, now go write about, you know, whatever he wanted me to write. And so I'm good at following directions. <laughs> so I just did what he said. I'd write and write. And, uh, and then I'd send it off to him. And he'd say, oh, well, put a comma here, do, you know, whatever he wanted me to do. And, well, before you knew it, six months later, the book was done. Wow. <laughs> and it is a gift for your family. Yeah. I mean, that, that's yeah. a special part about this is that in terms of the history, knowing yeah. what happened and where, where everything happened. Um, so talk about your career. So you, you, um, you came to Santa Barbara in 1995 mm -hmm. uh, to be the CEO of a Girl Scout Council. And then and you did that for 12 years. You ended up working at Santa Barbara Bank and Trust. And then you were CEO of Santa Barbara Neighborhood Clinics. I don't think maybe a lot of people know that. Um, and then the CEO of another nonprofit. So you've been involved in service work. I know mm -hmm. you did projects in, in the Valley. And you, you, you have a heart for service. Mm -hmm. Talk about that. Gosh, you know, it kind of all started back in the sort of mid to late 70s when I was living in the San Joaquin Valley, this little town, um, agricultural town called Kingsburg, raising my kids. And I noticed that uh, you know, there were lots of farm worker families whose kids went to school with my kids and they didn't have enough clothes, they didn't have enough food, they didn't, you know, all of this. So I thought, huh, we need to do something about that. So, well, long story short, I ended up founding a couple of organizations there to meet the needs of the farm worker family. So, you know, food bank, uh, a thrift store, so they could get things that they needed at a price they could afford, um, health care, uh, even a, a church, so, so they could come and worship God in their own language, which was not available in this little town at the time, and just all kinds of parts to this nonprofit. Uh, a preschool, uh, and then different parts. I sort of spun off eventually so they could have their own board and, you know, and all that. And so, oh, so anyway, you, you said so my career. So that sort of started the whole thing. Then when it came time for me to get a full-time job that actually supported myself, <laughs> I thought, gosh, I wonder what I am. Hmm. So I decided I must be what they call an executive director. So I put this resume together. And I moved to Stockton and took the job as CEO for um, San Joaquin County Child Abuse Prevention Council. And I did that for five years. And then in 95, I was off to Santa Barbara to take the job with Girl Scouts and then, uh, you know, all the others. Yeah. So, so what is it about this kind of, I mean, it's not, most people don't do that. I mean, where you're, you see a problem and you say, we got to do something about that. Uh, what is it about the, what is it that happens in your heart that, that motivates you to do the work that's needed 
to serve people? Gosh, that's such a good question. Mm. It just sort of bubbles up, I guess, you know. I see some people with some challenges, and I'm thinking, gosh, this isn't right. We could figure this out. And I, it feel, to me, it feels like I just do the logical thing, put one foot in front of the other. Um, but at that time in Kingsburg, uh, I was a new Christian. And so, and so I, um, I tend to be a little analytical, you know. So I was reading the scriptures. Nah, 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 nah. If I'm a Christian, who is this person Christ that I'm supposed to be following? And what does his priority list look like? Yes. <laughs> so I saw over and over that the poor really yep. mattered, that they were important. Yep. So I thought, well, hmm. uh, all the churches here ought to really want to help with this right. idea. Well, you know, it took them a while, but they, you know, eventually got behind it. So, Wow. That's a great way to look at it. What, what was important to Jesus? The poor, the hurting, when I was... That, that's, that's very interesting. So faith has been part of your journey. Right, it has. And, and I feel like if a person kind of has faith and believes a certain way, their actions should demonstrate that. Yeah. You know, whether it demonstrates it, obviously, <clears throat> to somebody else looking on, or... It just feels like I'm doing the right thing, demonstrating it to myself. You know, that's always sometimes a little different. But yeah, yeah, yeah. it feels like there should be some consistency, action, that sort of thing. Action, right? Yeah, yeah. I think it says in there somewhere, "Faith without works is dead." Yeah. So I mean, the action's important. Uh, so, so you've done all this executive work, executive director, CEO, nonprofits. You've built stuff. And now, recently, you've been doing consulting. You've mm -hmm. been doing helping nonprofits, helping boards. Talk about the work you do, how you do it, and what it actually is. You know, I've been, golly, I've, I've been on, um, worked with many different boards. And uh, so I, it's just another situation where I see a need um, in every nonprofit's board's needs are different yeah. one from the other um, but I feel like gosh I've had all this experience uh, I should contribute that to help other people other boards other nonprofits so they can do their good work there are so many as you know right doing all kinds of really good work yeah in our community and you know everywhere so uh, so I try to bring some a level of consistency and help the board um, sort of have a common language, see their organization through a similar lens, um, have a sort of a consistent way of looking at their work and understanding what their responsibility is versus what it's not. Because when a board member or a board, when, when they're involved in sort of getting down in the weeds and getting right. too much involved in operations, they can't uh, do their good work, which is policy and governance and supporting the executive director or the CEO, whatever yeah. that might be, right. and being an ambassador to the community. Right. You know, if their time and energy is taken up with, well, let me just dig around here and right. see if, you know. Right. Uh, so. Totally agree. Yeah. So I try yeah. to help with that ever so carefully yeah so it's it's vision strategy is that part strategy, of strategy strategy is yeah the vision of course wh what are we trying to create here right what new reality do we want to bring right. uh, to the future and then where are we now what do we look like now yeah and then what does that gap look like fine what's the strategy that's going to get us from where we are today to the vision right that where where we want to be right in the future that's a I, yeah and i love your definition of the but that's exactly what the way you define the board's role is exactly the, what what i believe govern you know set policy mm -hmm. and support the leader yeah <laughs> that, right. that, that that that's so crystal you crystallized what 
that that's exactly what I what I think. And I think for boards to be effective, those are the things. And then you then you add on being an ambassador of the community, which mm-hmm. of course is great. But but I think that's so true. The, the keeping boards out of the weeds, out of the stuff yeah. that's going to suck them into areas where I mean you, that's why you have a staff, right? Exactly. Right. And let's trust them to do their work. Tr- right. Right, or find a new staff. It, yeah, you do and trust. if they're not doing the work, then let's do a little evaluation and let's get somebody in right. here who can do it. Right, so do, so is this fun for you, this kind of consulting I love work? it. Yeah. I, I love it. I it's always it. a challenge because there's always a little tweak, a little something different. Like just recently, um, you know, and, and there are all kinds of boards and challenges and all, you know, from, oh my gosh, I need a lot of work, to just recently I worked with the Junior League. And they called me and I thought, you know, I've worked with them before, but gosh, they're so good. I work with so many boards. And I'm telling you what, Junior League, that board, that organization, they've got their act together. Hmm. I thought, I wonder why they want me, you know. (laughs) And so, but they're so wise. They said, we want to make sure that we're doing all the governance stuff right. We want to make sure that everybody's on the same page. We have some new members. We want to make sure we're all, you know, coming at this as a team from the same direction. I thought, okay, great. So we spent like most of a day together working on all that and it was just wonderful. Wow, yeah. so great. So nonprofits can reach out to you. Mm-hmm. Is, what is your website? Is it Cinder Sinclair? Or My what's website, your website? Or is it Nonprofit it's Nonprofit Connect. Connect. Nonprofit, Nonprofit, Connect. Nonprofit, Nonprofit Connect.org and it's with a K, K-I-N-E-C-T, Nonprofit yeah. Connect. Dot org. So that's where they can find you. That's yeah. really great. That's that's wonderful. So in the book, first of all, I wanted to start with resilience. So mm-hmm. chapter two is the power of resilience. Mm. Talk about that in your own life. Kind of the, because you you are a very resilient, after reading this, I, I think you are a very resilient mm-hmm. person. Is that something, talk about resilience in your life and how that's kind of been developed over time. Gosh, it's just something that I not just believe in, but depend on. I try not to take it for granted, but I think sometimes I do, just because it's an expectation. Um, it, it's sort of a survival thing. It's in order to survive and thrive and enjoy your life, I feel like you have to be resilient because a given is that we're going to have setbacks. There right. are going to be disappointments. Right. There are going to be things that just sort of you know, right. knock us yeah. down. Right. And so um, I heard somebody say one time, it's not how many times you get knocked down, it's how many times you get up. Yeah, right. Yeah. And so um, the assumption for me is, of course you're going to get up and you're going to find a new way to do this. Maybe circumstances have changed. Maybe there's a challenge. Fine. What's going to be your response to that? Yeah. And so, so that, that has served me well. It, it just sort of came naturally, I guess, when I was a kid. And so I can be grateful. You know, maybe resilience is, a, maybe it's hereditary. I don't know. Who knows? Right. Um, because when I was a kid, it just came uh, naturally. And then as a, an adult, I recognized it and intentionally uh, went after that resilience, whatever that might look like, and reminded myself, don't forget, you're resilient. You can do this. I love it. It's so good. And in the back of the book, you you, you talk about some principles, life lessons, mm. um, page 362, where you're... So I want to just kind of go through a couple of them, oh, if sure. we, have, we have a little bit of time left. But persistence, which is mm-hmm. kind of like resilience. Um, but the second one is continuously choose joy. Mm-hmm. Talk about that. I think it's so important to choose joy. There are so many things that can make us sad, justifiable things, Right. Uh, get us off our game. But there are always so many things to focus on that bring joy. And so I think almost as a discipline, okay, yeah. how can I choose joy now? Right. And or recognize it in others. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that, that's another scripture that pops to my mind. Rejoice always. Mm-hmm. I say it again. Rejoice. Yeah. That's a choice, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, we we. I'm gonna choose to. I'm gonna choose joy. I'm gonna choose to rejoice. Yes. That's yes. that's really good. 
Uh, number three is find others' unique unique gifts. Talk about that one. You know, I learned that um, and really put it into my sort of way of being. Um, when I was working on my doctorate, there was this woman who was a, a, she was one of the professors. And it was getting toward the end and I was feeling kind of like, oh, man, I don't know if I can do this or not. What, mm, what, what am I doing anyway? You know, I was a little bit beaten up on myself. And she s said something to me like, I don't even know what she said, but it was basically, you know, you're so good at this. You are this and you're that and all these positive things that she saw in me. And I thought, huh, well, imagine that. <laughs> and so I think it's important for us to notice positive attributes of other people and not just notice them, but then to verbalize that right. to them. Yes. Like, for example, a lot of servers in restaurants um, are really good with people. And so I'll tell them, you know, what a great job they did, and I'll tell them what great people skills they, they have and why it's so important no matter what they do in their life. And they're like, oh, wow. So it, it's important to whoever we're talking to yeah. to notice right. their goodness and then to speak it out loud to them. I love that. And, and oftentimes, I think when you do that, you actually can call it out. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're, you may be telling them something about them that's true that they don't even know yet. Right. And all of a sudden, you're bringing it forth, you know. You're absolutely right about that. It's like when that. Jesus called Peter, who was the most unstable, up and down, all over the map guy. He called him the rock. Yeah. And he says, you're going to be the leader of the church. I mean, if I'm Peter, <laughs> you're you the right guy here. <laughs> yeah. But, but it's so true that we, if we, we name it, we can actually call it, call it, call mm -hmm. it out. That's, that's great. What was the other one I was? Yeah, build others to their highest potential. Find ways of adding value. Mm. I thought that was good. Find ways of adding value. You know, I wrote this stuff a while back and I haven't read it lately. I'm reminding so you find, of what you wrote. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so find ways of adding value. I think that each person has their own set of abilities, natural, natural abilities, um, gifts, that sort of thing. And so I always think, how, what, what can I add here? Because if we know what our gifts are, if we know what our special abilities are, then we know how we can contribute them to other people, other situations other organizations and so I think that's yeah that's good and probably I mean that must come in, into your work with boards I mean and, mm -hmm. and staff what can this board how can this board member add value right you know what's their unique skill set yeah some somebody's in finance or law or whatever it might be having them add that value to the to the picture that's good focus on the positive and then this is one I, I loved always create beauty <laughs> talk about that one. Oh gosh you know i think one of the ways that we create beauty is in the lives of other people so bringing out their special value their special gifts their special talents that creates beauty right. in the world uh, whether they realize it or not yes yeah, and culture. You mentioned in here, you've created a workplace cultural culture multiple times. Operating systems, strong staffing, staffing teams, and then you've seen at times the next leader reverse everything oh, that gosh. you had built. Yeah, culture is a very important thing, isn't it? It is. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and I have, frankly, been disappointed sometimes when that happens. And at first, I thought, well, all these business books I read, they say. If you create, if you're a good leader and you create a good culture and you leave, it's going to stay like that. Right. And the first time that ever happened to me where this culture that I created uh, crumbled, I thought, oh, I guess I'm not such a good leader after all. Oh. But then I realized after reading, you know, other books and hearing other people's things and noticing, I realized that, no, my job as a leader is to create the culture, a positive culture that's going to really support all of the people while I'm there. And if it continues when I leave, great. Yeah. And if it doesn't, it doesn't mean that I didn't do a good job while right. I was there. Right. Yeah, I agree with that. And every situation is different. 
Yeah. Because right. so I so I come into an organization as a CEO, for example, the organization already has a culture, and if I see I want to change it, and I do. I've seen times where it, when I leave, it whoop, like a rubber band bounces right back to what it was before. So I've decided I'm just going to be happy whatever I do with that culture yeah, yeah, while I'm the there. Yeah, while you're there. <laughs> no, that's good. And then, you know, another one is showing up, showing up and paying attention, and, which I think is so, I think showing up is underrated, yeah. you know, consistently. Find your heroes, trust your own wisdom, which I thought was a great way. This is great. So wonderful job well, on thank this you. book. And so again, My Wild and Precious Life, Dr. Cinder Sinclair, a memoir of joy, grief, and adventures. I encourage you to get it. And if you're interested, if you're, if you're running a nonprofit, you know of a nonprofit that could use Cinder's wisdom, uh, you can go to nonprofitconnect.org with, with nonprofit connect with a K, K-I-N-E-C-T dot org, and you can find her there. Thank you. This is Thank fun. you. This was great fun. Thanks yeah, a lot. Great to be with you. Thanks for your good work. We'll see you next time.